Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show, episode number 303, with me, your host, Agassino Zynga. How's it going? Amazing. Good to see you. It's been a while. Um, Last episode was maybe a few weeks ago, I think. Nothing has changed thus far in between that time, apart from maybe my expanding waistband, my blurring of my times and my runs, my inability to sleep well at night because I'm warm and I'm hot and I'm hot and I'm warm. And just general malaise, isn't it? But there's nothing else going on, right? In the world right now, I don't think. <laughs> nothing else worth mentioning anyway, for the most part. But yeah, here we are. I think we're, I don't know if we're in week three or whatever we are of the lockdown, but somewhere further down the line than we expect it to be and nowhere closer to the finishing line. But, you know, what can we do? We've all been put in these difficult positions. No point whining and, you know, crying about it. It is what it is. You have to... Um, make the best out of it or just not make anything of it at all and just allow the days to go by uh, before a solution is found you know it's, it's quite helpless in that regard but it's also it's, it's also a little bit of slight gratification because we're all going through it in it when you're doing these things on your own or when you have a a very challenging moment in your life and it feels like the whole world is that wants to swallow you whole or it feels like every turn you make or every turn that you decide to make you end up walking into a, wo- a roadblock or running into one that can be a little bit difficult but when you know everyone else is going through the exact same thing as you then it probably brings you some level of comfort which is quite macabre you know? it goes to show how selfish we are as human creatures that we somehow glean a little bit of delight in that other people are going through just as much as pain as we are um, which is kind of bad but hey it is what it is Aside from that, what else is going on? I would say, yeah, so, um, yeah, lockdown's going on as it is. Um, I've seen rumours about football coming back quite soon. That's something, that's a slight bit of respite, but I think it might affect people negatively also. I'm not too sure how they're going to, because I don't think we've kind of, um, we've not really seen how society's going to react once other industries come back that are kind of entertainment-led, like, you know, because all the stuff we have on TV now has been, what, it's been stuff that they've had back that's probably the good thing about tv they have to plan their schedule maybe a year in advance right most streaming platforms are the same too i'd imagine maybe 18 months even um so you have the added advantage that if something goes wrong you have stuff to kind of play on the continuous loop for you know months and months and months and months but i don't know how we're going to react once that kind of digital once that kind of you know archive footage uh on our tv screens on our streaming platforms things that's been banked already is kind of Put, got put aside and then we start promoting live events i don't know how people are going to react so there might be there might be a, some precautions put into place as to how we go about doing those kind of things because it might not be cool it might not work out the way they want it it might actually encourage people to go out you know as we've seen with the weather over the weekend people tend to kind of get a little bit heady they will look outside the window they start to get a bit annoyed that they're not outside with their friends and stuff which is weird in itself because you know the only thing we've been asked to do from most of our governments is just to stay in really and we haven't been asked to kind of bear arms or you know or go in i don't know go to a farm somewhere and do the harvest because i've heard that's coming up i've actually watched the slava zizek interview recently on the michael brooks show and he mentioned something about that happening where the harvest season is due to come up so there might be a need for some country especially in the mediterranean to call upon their young people to go to these farms to harvest them because those fruits and vegetables are going to be needed in order to kind of bring some level of economy some level of income to that company to that country so once um stuff gets back to normal so that could be interesting but we've never been asked to do that which means sustain and some people just you know just can't do it which is okay i think i think we need to have a bit of compassion for it i think it's fine that people are breaking the rules i think it should be expected not fine it should be expected we shouldn't, shouldn't of course it's not a fine thing you shouldn't be doing it but it shouldn't be that much of a shock i think um for the most part we're starting to realize just how important it is for us to be around the people that we love um people that mean a lot to us as opposed to maybe the material things and the you know all that other stuff because i think there was a period maybe it's gonna stop and i don't know because i'm not sure how everyone's fomo is but i know i i'd never really had fomo really i'd say i'd say maybe i might be gutted about not going somewhere but because i decided oh i'm not going to go to this place lastminute.com or i decided to pull out an event or something cool but i don't really have FOMO as if like oh i wish i was at this event not really because i know I, I did i don't wish because if i would have wished i would have went in i would have bought a ticket but i wonder if people who do suffer from FOMO, whether or not this period in time has been beneficial in that you know there is no FOMO to suffer because there's nothing going on 
and the people who purposely put out content on their social trying to go because there is a bit there is a bit of FOMO is it what do you call it FOMO trapping right yeah there's a first trap yeah, there is probably a FOMO trap out there that exists where so that group of people enjoy um, boasting about the places they go because I remember that was a big thing I remember seeing this article quite sure let me try I'll try and get up here actually I think I'm having a list I've got my list here yeah so I remember seeing this weird article once maybe it was when the shift in yeah I think it was when maybe the shift around I would say do you remember when it was like all the rich kids of Instagram do you remember that that Instagram account I'm not sure if it's still around anyway but let me see if I can find it um rich kids of Instagram okay supposedly it's still here Rich Kids Balance on what's this? Is this the same one? <laughs> Let's see if I can find it. I don't think it's the one. Rich Kids. Rich Kids of Instagram. Let's see if I can find it. One second. Profile. Why isn't that on here anymore? I don't know. Okay, maybe it's not on there. Oh, okay, yeah, Rich Kids of the Internet. Okay, but well, there's another one called Rich Kids of the Maybe this is the same one, same sort of. I don't see how many followers they got. Is it a big? Yeah, it's a big one. It's like nearly half, half a million. So I remember around the time when these sort of accounts started popping up everywhere, right? These Rich Kids of Instagram accounts, where especially they um, featured the kids of, you know, families whose wealth that, you know, is unaccounted for, people that work in the manufacturing industries, not anyone super famous. There would be some super famous families there, but for the most part, it's just undercover people, you know? Some guy who, who fucking invented this, the screwdriver or the fucking bolt that you put on the bottom of your TVs. Those kind of dudes who have money for, like, generation and generations. So those kids will, you know, more likely than not, are the quintessential rich kids who, you know, they don't really do much. They just kind of uh, spend their parents' money and just exist, which is, you no, know, there's no slight to them, I think. There is a common, there is a some sort of weird common group think where everyone thinks, oh, if I was a rich kid, I would be doing all this for charity, all that sort of nonsense. But you wouldn't really, innit? If you were, if you had the means to, you know, some again, I don't rely on my parents for anything, but I know some people do, and they and they take the piss with their parents as it is. So just imagine you taking the piss with your parents just as it is, because you know you're asking your mom to borrow you a hundred quid so you can buy a gram of coke, you know, on the you know the weekend before payday because you got no money. Yeah, so what would you do if your parents suddenly happened to be the fucking founder of B or, or B Sky B or something? You'd be all over their fucking account. So I think a lot of that hate towards them was a bit unjustified. But I remember around this sort of time, and you're going back to the point, there was a there was a period in time where this was what Instagram was all about, right? Flaunting your possession, showing how cool you were, you could get chicks and shit. It is obviously um, Dan Bell's there and I wonder if he's posting normally whilst Corona is going on actually is he doing it or is he being a bit like undercover what's he doing I'm sure some people on the internet like oh you shouldn't be doing that you should be doing it or is he on lockdown with all these hotties he probably is right yeah, he's on lockdown with all the hotties okay going through old pics is he posting anything new I don't know but he's not really saying anyway but anyway look, I remember this this being the big thing isn't it right posting you know all your inconspicuous uh, spending all that sort of stuff then there was a shift where people started posting, um, what's this guy? What's this video about? Yeah, okay, let him do what he wants. But then I remember there was a bit of a shift where people started um, posting more experiential stuff, right? Um, that kind of boasted the, maybe the trend of people holding, you know, girls in front of the guy, holding his, holding a hand out, like in that weird position. And then, you know, they go away to get on some magical holiday trip. And, and a lot of those kind of YouTubers who had those vlogs where they go to travel the world, they don't really tell you what they do. Most of them are rich kids and they're not. But it was a bit of a shift in terms of lifestyle. Not really actually possessions and what you got and who your friends are, but more of a lifestyle thing, right? And genuine friendships, quote unquote. But, what's the point? This is whole, but I don't think, but yeah, I was going to say, but with the lockdown, maybe we might see a return. Maybe the people who are suffering from are the worst were the ones who purposely were doing those experiential traps like you know like i said fomo traps to make people feel as if they should be missing out something but that person themselves wasn't really interacting and you know living in a moment as they should be it reminds me of that famous you know video from coachella where um someone's taking a picture of somebody somebody is making the video everyone at coachella like essentially on their phone and not actually enjoying the festival which you know is probably by the by because a lot of the kids that go there are really young it's a mostly 
event that's marketed or kind of designed in a way that would bring the best out of it on social the ferris wheel the big plant thing everyone stands in front of what the stages are put the fact that it's in a big wide open space loads of good sunlight yeah loads of good natural light sorry so you know i know what they're kind of trying to do there but i remember that video going everyone like, oh my god that's crazy but i was like yeah that's what everyone does i think most there's some group of people who don't post that I, I i do it just for mostly privacy reasons because i just want to do my shit but i know a lot of people who kind of put out do this kind of fake thing where they go somewhere and then they'll take those pictures but never upload them whilst they're there but then they'll upload them incorrectly whilst they're back home to make it seem as if they're, they're still traveling or they'll split out split up the days that they post it so they'll maybe post it over two to three period even though they're only there for like the weekend and if I, someone asks them in the comments oh were you guys there were you just hanging out i'm so glad i missed you they'll never answer so that kind of goading and that kind of trapping of fomo might stop because people might just be like you know what I don't care where I'm at as long as I have my, you know, best friend from work, my best friend from, you know, outside of work with me, I'm good. It might return people back to a form of normality. Normality? Normality, yeah, hopefully. That's a hope, but who knows? Probably won't, but, you know, you can learn you live in hope. I'll try and be, I'm trying to be optimistic as I can with this stuff, but one thing that made me really laugh, actually, that I saw earlier or that made me kind of pause and think was trying to understand the other side of things, isn't it? So this video went around all these protests in america with some people in different states protesting the lockdown and wanting to be you know back to work or when to just go about their everyday life and i understood where they're coming from to be honest i think it's good to have compassion with people during this time because again i think it's unprecedented no one really knows what to do as proved by some of the governments and what their kind of reactions towards it so you know being a little bit understanding can maybe uh, is more of an interesting way to look at things and has more layers to it than just simply write them off as being dumb and crazy and this video kind of explains a little bit it's from global news quickly check this out here a healthy immune system and i take care of my body i eat the right food i take vitamins i drink the right water vitamin d vitamin c has been proven already so we have everything that we need we don't need a vaccine okay so that that opinion is obviously insane isn't it right saying you don't need the vaccine because you you're healthy and you need all that stuff i don't have obviously but i don't know maybe intrinsically it's very difficult to make people care about a world that they're not going to inhabit after this thing has passed or just past their maybe immediate family you know and everyone says oh when you have kids your perspective changes and all that sort of stuff right that's a good thing okay i get it it makes you maybe focus down a little bit and you know where your priorities are and you know what you should be focusing on what you shouldn't be focusing on um it makes you kind of you know stop wasting time and just in general right you, you priorities get lasered in but why weren't they lasered in and why wouldn't why didn't you have more of a kind of world view of the way your kind of part the play the part you play in the world before that why did it need a kid to come into world you to suddenly give a shit about other kids right that's the problem so if it, i'd imagine if you're going to i'd imagine the, the problem would be a, unless it serves our own self-interest we don't give a shit right so i'd imagine if you were for a charity that was looking after that was kind of it's emma was to this to house kids who were grew up in you know, displaced kids who grew up in really bad neighborhoods and you went around to i don't know just a charity just give money to, to build these things not to not for anyone to even house these kids and you went to an area that kind of consisted of a large population of people who didn't have any kids and were single and probably were you know more likely not to have them later on in life they probably won't be more likely to give any money right as opposed to going to an area where they have a lot of teen they have a big college university you know uh, attendance all that sort of stuff so people might just want to only serve the things that they give a shit about which is good which is understandable in one way but also quite worrying that you have to go you something has to affect you directly in order for you to give a shit which is quite bleak that means that unless it happens to you you don't care um and then when it does happen to you suddenly now everything becomes so clear but again i think if you're from the land of the home land of the brave home of the free you have to be able to just let these people protest it's, it may be ill advised you might there might be a video of like you know five years later and you go to these people and half of them are not around anymore but i don't i understand the actual idea that you know maybe these people aren't as well off as me and you are right because i think there is a 
lack of understanding that if you're actually working from home or you have the ability to be furloughed that you're actually in the top five percent of the population right in terms of affluence in terms of life expectancy in terms of education in terms of a um, earning potential you have more range in that regard than people like this who who ex who only exist based on the work that they do on any given day so they can't take time off they can't just be off for an, a month and everything be okay because they're not too sure if their manufacturing plant will stay and be around they're not too sure if the shopping center they work in or the cafe whatever it is and what we're seeing now is that these people that work these menial jobs which is funny because a lot of them you know the, the term essential work has been um touted in terms of categorizing of the workforce non-essential essential and i think the the work the positions that people look down upon the most right the people the positions that people think oh if i were there i'd be on my lowest are now the ones that are basically holding this economy up together right the people that post one in the morning the guy that delivers your uber eats the guy that delivers your amazon the person that works in the supermarket the person that does your checkout like all these people are super integral to making sure this this society of ours doesn't crumble people just protesting here and the shutdown give me liberty or give me covid which is an insane statement isn't it? there's no reason to shut the whole state down 99 percent of the people for the one less than one percent of people that are vulnerable to the, to the virus and the facts speak for themselves it's true it's an interesting argument though isn't it which i think is maybe just there might be an, like i'd imagine if you lived in a state that had a prominent or had a large Asian or Asian um, population who were maybe away during that time of the year before the Chinese New Year or whatever maybe yeah well, yeah maybe they were during that time or just away from family you could be advised or you might you wouldn't be way out of line to maybe halt any travel from that place or from that particular region into your state until a given time right that would be probably quite correct to do um, so. I like the idea that different states do different ways are reacting to it different ways but obviously you want you know the um the white house to have precedent and to kind of set the mandate but if they do live in a state that has a low population of people who are over the age of 60 they might be they might have a point you might need to leave certain industries open and tell other people to stay inside in it that could be a big thing too um and i think that might end up happening i think we might get to a point where they just they just can't keep people indoors anymore that's just it because what you don't want is civil disobedience in it you want to get to the point where you are giving people permission to go back outside as opposed to them rebelling and saying now fuck that we're not listening to you ever again just going because when this once they go out you know you have no idea what's going to happen in it look what happened with the london riots right one uh running with police with a young man who ends up dying and suddenly you know the half of fucking east london's burning down so they have to be very careful about that Yeah, loads of them just protesting outside the what? Concern, I, but it's been politicized. This is a tool now. This is a tool to keep us at home and on house arrest. We're not on house arrest. We've been asked to social distance. We can wear our masks. We, we can stay distance from people. I'm not on house arrest. I refuse. I walk out of my house now. Okay, fair enough, ma'am. And again, who knows? But history will history will judge who is right or wrong in this case, isn't it? I thought that was interesting. What else we want to go through? Let's move on in. Bo, 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 bo. Let's get that off the screen. And then you have this crazy lady doing this. I don't know what this dance is about, but I thought this was quite lols. Um, what's her name? Angela something. Angela Bel Camino. I'm sure this is maybe a troll account, or if it's not a troll account, it's probably one of those pop people on social who just, you know, say things for the sake of it or do things for the sake of it. But this video was going viral over the weekend, and it's just nuts. So this girl is doing this "Liberate America" of Trump dance. I don't know what this means. I'm not sure if it's a performance piece. I'm not sure if it's one of those drama school student people. What? She's an actor at something. What's she an actor at? Actor at where? I don't know. But anyway, what? Look at this. Oh, 
Like, what is that? If you're just listening to the podcast, it's just girl standing in the alleyway somewhere with her friends wearing jeans that have knee holes next to her shins, it looks like. And she's got those basic bitch, like, you know, wet high, you know, high heeled boots on. And she's doing this weird dance that's, well, I don't know if it's a rain dance to get people that like Trump annoyed or something, but it's just bizarre. This is politics for you, isn't it? It's like, what? I don't get any of it. I don't understand what's going on. But it's what, 1.8 million views, and I probably added more to it. And um, yeah, this is the other side of the aisle, isn't it? You got one side of the people saying, oh, you know, my body, my choice. If I get it, I get it, but I want to go back to work. Then you got people like this who are, I don't know, dancing against what Trump, what he's saying. I don't know, like against his actions, against how he's dealing with it. I don't know what again. I don't know what it means. Liberate America of Trump. So okay, cool man. But yeah, that was interesting. Or was it? I don't know. Maybe I wasted a little bit. Twenty one seconds of my life. But anyway, let's move on. We have an interesting article about influencer suffering during the whole lockdown, which is. Maybe um, it's a little bit uh, hyperbolic, I think. It's from Wired, and they're saying the influencer economy hurtles towards its first recession, right? Let's get, get it down on here, get this off, and put this on screen so you guys can see it. So this is an article from Wired. Uh, I might quickly read it here. But again, I think it's a bit hyperbolic, but it says, uh, faced with pandemic on one hand and slash budgets on the other, some industry outsiders say that it's time for influencers to evolve, right? Which is whatever. Um I'd say before even reading it, I'd say influencers are recession proof or they should be in fact because, you know, part of the reason why they work so well is because they have direct relationship to their customer base and customers actually trust them, right? Or the fans trust their opinion on what they have to say, especially the micro influencers who are like, you know, 100 million or 100,000 followers to 100 million, 100,000 followers below. Yeah, uh, yeah, and below those guys are the one guys. Those guys and girls are the ones that are really smashing it because they actually move culture. They actually move the needle. They, they can actually get a product to sell out in minutes, right? More so than a million ones because it's a bit hit and miss. Their audience, you know, you're not sure who's, you're not sure how many people that follow Kylie just follow her because they want to see a bum and all that. You know what I mean? It gets a bit murky. But when you have a hundred thousand and less, you usually have um, most of your audience made up of people who actually give a shit about what you're about, what you stand for, the products you make, the services that you provide. Um, so as long as they're able to be honest with their audience and not lie right and not embellish and not you know um hide things whatever it may be um they'll be completely fine it's the ones that who just relied on you know maybe brand deals to get um to become an influencer or where you maybe get flown out to a certain place by uh, a booking company you might get accommodated by a hospitality accumulate company all these things they will suffer more because they are um they are hand tied to those brand deals. They don't have any kind of equity on their own. Um, they can't necessarily sell a product. They can't really necessarily sell a service or um, all they are is essentially like a celebrity that accepts brand deals. Maybe is that a great way to say it? Um, which is what most people are nowadays, unless they have an actual craft or a talent. They usually are just, they get the celebrity and they use that to get brand deals. Um, most people in love and hip hop do that same sort of thing, right? That's where the whole flat tummy tea thing started, I'd assume. But anyway, let's continue. It says, um, the first signs of distress came hot uh, with panic, but pos positivity. Hope you're all feeling safe and are all at peace, hunkered down in your family, one influencer wrote, paired with a selfie featuring her adorable children in pyjamas. Another post of photo of her mini, oats, her mini oasis, sorry, a selection of well-kept houseplants along with a caption, hashtag stay at home. The new coronavirus provided an opportunity to reflect, to reset, to use code Rachel for twenty percent off on home fitness classes. The influencers carried on with their loungewear, sipping with cream coffee, modeling a sense of ease in the face of calamity. Privately, though, some influencers have watched, have watched with growing sense of dread as the world collapses, uh, taking their earning potential with it. Brand deals have dried up, sponsored posts have been delayed, and the great reckoning is likely to topple the influence industry. But now. But by now, sorry, um, it's already too big. But the business of influence is going to change. If you think about the way an economic reception works, some companies survive and some companies don't, says Angela Seitz, Senior Director of Consumer Insights Engagement Strategy at the agency PG PMG. I think that it could be the same thing that happens in the influence industry. Yeah, that, that goes without saying, though, isn't it? I think there, it's always going to be the case. You're always going to get the best people um will be able to maneuver and evolve and adapt 
you know, um, to the crisis, the ones that aren't who are a bit base and just do it for the clout or just do it for the freebies, they're the ones that are going to suffer. That is, you know, it goes without saying. And it continues. Um, for years, the influencer company has operated in boom times. Flash marketing, budget funded, closes of expensive clothes and paid vacations for exotic locals. With more Americans taking cues from social media about where and what to buy, brands has, have started to go all in. A survey by Media Kicks and Influencer Marketing Industry found that 70% of companies spend over half of their marketing budget on influencers which is which is what it should be it should actually be half and half right it should be half of companies spend it on influencers say only 17 spend it on half is crazy that means there's still a big majority of companies that don't give a shit about marketing on, on social media which is nutty in it there's so much money left on the table i guess gary v was right in that respect as recently as six weeks ago one report estimated that influencer marketing will grow to 9.7 billion in 2020 but it's not all mega influencers either. Micro influencers who managed a targeted following of under 100,000 less, like I mentioned, make up the backbone of the industry. Even people with just a few thousand followers can earn thousands, hundreds of dollars for a single sponsored post. It's not hard to earn an income anyway. Um, eight year olds can do it, provided some adult supervision. So of course, I think honestly, I'd, like it's probably bad to say if no one actually thinks this is hard when it comes to entertainment industry stuff, but. You know, if you hear your favorite musician, right, is getting a $10.8 million deal somewhere, there is a part of me, personally, me, I still think my favorite, my favorite is Drake, for instance, and I heard you got a $10, $10 million contract to make this new album. I still think $10 million is way under his value when it comes to him providing art or providing, you know, a sonic soundtrack that's going to, you know, play a part in you know an untold amount of people's lives from now until later you can't really put a number on it really can you right if he makes one track that gets you through college that allows you then to go and you know meet the love of your life in the workplace that you go that affects somebody to go and maybe i don't know whatever everyone's got their little story with the track they have can you really put a number on it right like he's you're, you're you're his fan forever so you're essentially going to be ride or die with him until the day that he dies and even more so when he dies you're going to be able to remember all the good times he provided for you the record label is going to be able to place his music in various different, you know, planes, whether it's advertising, whether it's marketing, whether it's sales, right? He can probably go into another role in a company too. There's so many different avenues you can go in. So to put a value on it is, you know, it's a bit of a waste of time. So I think sometimes it's in, in social media marketing, or mostly in influencer marketing, I think a lot of those guys undersell themselves, right? For the amount of product they can actually move. Because usually, if you're in a position to get attention, or if you're in a position to get headhunted by an agency or to be approached by a brand, you're usually somebody that's got that they can judge by the metrics. You've got quite good engagement, right? People are commenting on your things, they're looking at your images, they're clicking the links, they're liking the stuff, you know they give a shit about what you post so the brand when they're approaching you is hoping because you're an expert in your particular field you can take their dreadful product usually and you know tell your fans to give it a chance and that is going to do more for that company than it, you know spending a million pounds on fucking you know ad banners or on google adwords or whatever it may be right because you know they don't really know what they're doing or they don't really have any brand equity they should be better off building some kind of noise some kind of traction on social and then parlaying that into other paid avenues or other paid you know traditional paid marketing avenues like facebook marketing or facebook ads which you know it's not to say it's a traditional but in that regard that might be a better way to do it so these i get honestly I, I, like i think they're undervalued really so maybe post this you might get a bit of a leveling off where there might be you know more of an acknowledgement on both ends like on the influencer and the brand side that they maybe should work together to cultivate a relationship see if it works out see if it meshes see if there's any you know link synergy between them and then maybe build up a plan or an execution plan in terms of what they do when they roll it out their marketing stuff is always just instead of just sending somebody a brush and telling them to stand in front of a mirror maybe there's some way that they could do it that would be different to each person maybe i don't know but um, I still think these guys aren't getting paid as much as they should be getting paid. And in many here, it says, um, 
As a new coronavirus sends the world hurtling towards a recession, though, more glamorous trappings of the influencer lifestyle have come to halt. Pay trips have no place amid lockdowns, nor do street star photo shoots to model uh, sponsored clothes. And it's not clear that those opportunities will repeat in the future, at least not for everyone. The pandemic is having a major effect, uh, impact sorry, on the overall influence industry, and it's likely to have lasting effects, says cites this uh, PMG woman, which of course is true, and it? like it's standard par course at. For one thing, there's just less money going around. As of March, the market uh, the market research e marketer found that about a third influence was already seeing. Um, fewer collaborations. Some of those may return as the economy rebound, but other brands will sever their ties with influencers who haven't shown they can drive sales, which is what it always should be. I think, as per usual, most of these companies just did it shit, right? They did it how they did most marketing avenues, right? Whether it's email, whether it's ad, banner ads, whatever. They just pump money into it and don't necessarily see a value, don't really see any kind of return. There's no metric set up to judge what works and what doesn't work, and you just continue kind of, you know, following that loop. So they did it with it. So they, instead of signing, you know, free people who are really good at what they do in terms of influencer marketing, so they're signing up free, you know, influencers in general, and maybe putting most of you dividing your budget between those three people and going all in. They'd rather have a roster of like twenty five when really the ones that are bringing the most of value are the top two. So it's just a standard, um, you know, lack of preparation, awareness, and you know, judgment from them on that side. And it continues. Even before the pandemic, brands were already starting to prioritize longer term collaboration with influencers versus one of partnerships, says Jasmine Einberg, a senior analyst at eMarketer. Uh, besides the shrinking budget, it's also awkward to time to advertise. In the first few weeks of quarantine, we saw a decline in sponsored posts, said sites, whose agency brokers deals for brands like Sephora and Beast by Dre. There's a seven, there's an unsavoriness in hawking a product while record label sorry a record number of people are unemployed or facing life-threatening illnesses and the brands don't want to risk the wrong messaging which is definitely true and i guess for the for the influencers themselves they just don't want to seem yucky to their audience i think most influencers i don't it's different i think youtubers are a different bunch because youtubers seem to be able to get away with murder with their fans and they can literally do what they can be the most horriblest person in the world right they can do some really truly horrendous shitty things and their fans seem to just ride or die with them regardless whereas i think in traditional media or traditional entertainment circles if you do something that is unsavory you usually get outed by the maybe it's different now maybe it's different maybe because in hollywood if you get if you do something that people don't like or people don't agree with usually it's the industry that shuns you first and the industry is what people react to so if people shun you in the industry then your general fans will too because they don't want to be tired of your brush they don't want to be i mean so they don't, they don't want to have the kind of you know the mark on their head or the cloud over them whatever it may be but obviously if you're a youtuber you can kind of isolate yourself from that because there is no industry the industry exists on the internet and it's in the comments and if you just don't look at them you're fine um but they tend to get away with murder in that regard so um influencers aren't like that they're not giving that kind of grace i think because it's so you know maybe vapid or usually the people that you encounter who are influencers maybe aren't the best people it kind of gets a bad reputation but it seems like everyone is sort of waiting to to make a mistake so if you do do something that's a bit scummy if you get to put a hashtag ad or sponsored on your post people actually light you up and they don't have any remorse for that so i guess if you're that kind of person you've already got your fair share of stick you don't want any more you know what i mean you're like look let's just revisit these plans when everything kind of opens up again you don't want anyone to give you any sort of hassle so i definitely understand where that's coming from but it this be a lot really this last bit um i had a lot of brand campaigns this woman's site from mentioned saying i had a lot of brand campaigns that were set to go live in march and even early april and those have all been postponed says lauren else a micro influencer with thirty two thousand instagram floors one of them for a beer company decided against a sponsor post for fear of alienating viewers my income has definitely gone down and you know it is what it is man i think that is um that's okay though i think for the most part i would say if you are an influencer and you're seeing a decline your wages you have to be more aware that in the future if anything does happen again you have to be you know cash rich and have a uh, stockpile of cash especially if you're getting loads of brand deals because i think a lot of people who get those brand deals maybe are looking at it and maybe have adjusted their way of living in part due to the brand deals they're getting but if you're able to kind of get a brand deal and spec out you know how much you need to live with uh, you know because i'm sure if you get paid like 30 grand for a campaign if you're smart you just divide that by 12 months and imagine that's your like full-time salary and then if you're on top of that you just basically put into your savings you're perfectly fine in it you can live off you know more than 1500 a month i assume 
um, I think that probably is a lesson for all to be learned in terms of you know having some sort of cash supplies that are ready for you to use once you get into an emergency and I also just think you know the ones that are good influencer wise will hang around I think people will still want to hear what they have to say they'll still want recommendations about especially when it comes to um, knowing how to navigate a post-corona world right like what do you do like imagine if like um because nowadays we haven't necessarily seen a good response from most governments about or even like a really good detailed plan about what they're aiming to do in terms of reopening the economy imagine you're an influencer and you're able to pivot and provide stuff that's within your lane don't obviously start talking about you know fucking building hospitals and shit but stuff that's in your lane stuff that's in your warehouse stuff that appeals to your kind of audience if you're able to provide them with some information about i don't know how to safely um unbox uh, some makeup that you order from overseas all that sort of stuff that might go an actual long way so i think some of these guys need to be don't be so glum i think these articles are usually written for like you know people on the sidelines who aren't actually you know doing the stuff themselves but if you are i think i think it's a good time i think it allows you to kind of focus on in a little bit get back to your base be able to answer questions from people get personal again um you know get back to the old days just being a bit more scrappy and not relying on all the fancy lights and cameras and you know allowing your time to kind of build your audience re uh, reconnect with your community and again like i said once the gates reopen you can still be there for them to provide them with that extra bit of care the extra bit of attention that they probably don't feel like they're getting from mainstream media that'd be my opinion anyway so um next on the list here what else do we have <coughs> We got this idea of new is it new dates right or is it free yeah this is the free free phase plan for the uk which i don't necessarily see happening personally but anyway what can you do this is from the sun i know i shouldn't be reading it but hey ho ho the the the, the, the secret traffic light plan let's just get that let's just get it up and put it on fingers so i'm not actually on this song i don't actually have one have this on my address bar it's a bit bad so this is the plan that I've seen being featured in places. I should get this out there too. This is the plan I've seen being featured in places, right? Some sort of like free phase plan, especially this is for the UK or London or UK. Yeah, UK. They're trying to, this is what they're speaking in terms of when they're deciding things to go back to normal. So we have here red phase, partial lift, amber, extending freedom and green, wider freedom. And we've got dates May 11th, 25th and 15th. So, you know, there's still a couple of months to go until everything kind of in their eyes goes back to normal. But some of this stuff is widely optimistic and obviously it's only depending on how well people are able to behave between now and the 11th of may there's no guarantees that you know we're going to be in a position where things have halted we don't have a second wave the thing doesn't mutate whatever happens but for the red phase may 8, 11th they've got small non-essential shops reopen warehouses reopen hairdressers reopen nurseries reopen and travel should be discouraged right so I'm assuming people could still go to these places, but walk and whatever, maybe travel there. I mean, like overseas, maybe I don't too sure. But anyway, the next one for the Amber, June, June May 25th, sorry. They say small business will have to 50 staff reopen. Some local distancing measures in lifted. Wearing masks compulsory on public transport. Schools reopen and restaurants open, but with strict seating de uh, demarcations. The restaurants opening is going to be the difficult one, really, isn't it? Because I remember seeing this, there was actually this really fucking macabre video from Asia somewhere where they had, um, let me see if I can actually get it, where they had a kid, let me see this, uh, somewhere in Asia, they had like an Asia um, restaurant, restaurant, uh, lo lockdown, after lockdown, lockdown. I can find the video. Da, 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 da. No, not here. But essentially, they had people sitting and eating behind like a perspex glass. That was really wild. And I don't necessarily see that happening here. That everyone's sitting, you know, on the table like a circle with like these little um, foldable things that you put in front of you, so you can sit with your friends and talk that way. Everyone I came in got like a um, a temperature check. Everyone's wearing gloves and a mask. It was really, really depressing. So doing that you know to get the economy back up i'm not just sure how worth that is and of course there's an added um intrigue about what's going to be left once we go back anyway you know what i mean there might not be stuff around that people can actually go to in the first place so that might be a bit distressing but go back to the list um 
Then it says for the green phase, why the freedom? June fifteenth, you've got weddings and funerals can take place with larger groups, cinemas and theaters and comedy clubs and sports venues reopen, which is probably the biggest one, which again ties in with the idea. Because I remember in the beginning, oh, if they open, if they redo, if they restream or they start, sorry, if they restart, if they start putting on live events, there's no guarantee people are going to stay in. It might keep people that might get people angsty to go out again. But obviously, they're going to let people out for the most part, so that when those events are on, there's not a lot of civil unrest. Um, sis. And then pubs reopen as well, restrictions, where in the mask or compulsory and gyms reopen, but ensure in hard sanitation. But again, June 15th is a way off. There's no guarantee that that's going to happen. If it does, there's also no guarantee you're going to see the same amount of people out that we saw before. I think there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be more prone to being cautious and then being optimistic. Because, you know, although it might be a good time to get it around June 15th when a lot more people might be out of the hospital and you might you know, be get more, you know, attentive care, you still don't want to get it anywhere, right? Any video you watch of somebody that has it, it doesn't look like it's fun. So if you can avoid it, people will probably will avoid it. So there will be what? And that's an extra what? March, April, uh, March, April, May, June. That's an extra couple months in there or two months maybe at, at least, or maybe even more. Or people being out of work or restaurants closing and stuff i just don't know how they're gonna survive without some sort of support from the government really it doesn't make any sense in it i also meant to like i don't know move this a bit closer anyway let's continue here then we have do, 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 do. what do we have here what i want to talk about i thought was interesting should i go should i quit Da, 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 da. Encouraging this. There's actually a good one on RA too, isn't it? Let's see if I can find something that was on RA. The up and coming season in IV for yeah, this is one, but this is obviously in it. This I'm not too sure why they're even um bothering making this news because we knew this is gonna be fact, but this is from RA. It says um canceling IV for summer could cost up to four thousand nightclub jobs, which you know if anyone's if anyone has seen a video from an Ibiza place, you will know that you know it looks like there's a million people working in these bars, and in these resorts where people go and party and stuff. So I'm not surprised. It's a, it's a whole economy. It's a whole lifestyle. It's a whole um, you know occupation. It's basically a country in its own and it's, it's self really in it with Ibiza. But this article says the following: um, the 22 Ibiza season is on a knife edge. The ongoing 20 uh, COVID-19 pandemic left the White Isle in crisis with a typical clubbing calendar looking increasingly unlikely. I did read they were going to try and shift it to the fall in it, but I don't think it's going to happen. But anyway, it continues. If the island's super clubs and beach bars fail to open, it could cost up to 4,000 venue staff their jobs. Um, Dario Di Abifa reports. In Abifa, there is currently eight super clubs, says Jose Luis Benitez, head of Abifa Leisure Association, told Diario. And in each of them were between 300 and 350 people. Bloody hell. That is insane plus another hundred in less direct ways i'm assuming like street team and all that sort of shit right and he mentions continues i don't know if we'll ever get back to normal he says i don't know if we'll recapture the same level of tourism from the kind of uh, we've come to expect of course not the same article asserts that none of the main clubs will reopen this summer though it has yet to be confirmed by any of the venues earlier today the night league which runs um sister clubs high uh and um Ushula, um, got the cancellation rolling by rolling out a May open date. Whew. I reason I've had to reach out to Pinch Shakur for a comment. So that's quite bleak, isn't it? Especially from that dude uh, saying that he doesn't think it's going to be back to normal ever again, which is probably something that people don't really think of too often. What's going to actually happen once everything's over? Will people have the same habits? Will they be willing to take the same risk that they did previously, which I didn't probably think was a risk, right? I don't know, being in a swimming pool with a million pe different people in an IB for a club somewhere, um, you know, table, ordering a table, having drinks that you share and mixes that you share and maybe, you know, whatever, exchanging saliva, all that sort of stuff, whether it's from sexual advances or not. Um, and just generally, uh, the, the willingness of people to go outside might be less. Like I mentioned at the start of the show, I think this gets back to maybe us understanding at the base level we just like being around our friends and people that we like right as opposed to going out 
all the time to these far flung places just to see people that we like, right? Some people will book in holidays with their friends just so they can hang out, as opposed to just like, you know, going to hang out somewhere, right? Grabbing a drink somewhere in the local pub or getting some food to eat or just going to a park and just chatting shit, right? We didn't we don't do that anymore, right? Everything has to be these big, um, glitzy you know, showings so you can take pictures to show from other people on Instagram you don't even know. So maybe this might return us to a most base level where we just like, you know what? As long as I'm with people I like to be around with, I'm good. I don't care where I am. So maybe the need to go to these kind of ex um, you know, uh, these kind of these kind of activities are like going to festivals and what they're not or going to club nights or no not going to club nights, going to festivals, especially festival season or going uh, to Ibiza during Ibiza season that need might kind of lower down because some people that go you know from open to close you might need to only go for a weekend you might need to only go for a week for a couple of weeks um, that might be a good thing right you might get more connection with just hanging out with your friends at your local bar like I mentioned um, so yeah it's bleak for them but again it might go back to it might be better for Ibiza too it might go back to the old heady days of what it was before prior right when George Michael and co used to go there and it was you know a heavenly place maybe it might return back to its kind of hippie roots where it turns into more of a, you know, uh, less of a heady sense of escapism and more so of a place to go and grow mentally and spiritually and stuff. I don't know. It might there might be some good things to come from it, but I really do think, like I mentioned in this article, this guy said from um, one of the guys that's part of it says, you know, like people are underestimating the damage this is going to do to people's, you know, way of uh, conducting themselves. And part of the reason is because people's actions, what they decide to do, people frame businesses around them, right? Because we're lazy to go pick up a McDonald's, somebody decides to make an app that someone they can deliver to you right into your hands, or right in front of your doorstep. Sorry. So the moment you decide to start cooking at home, you fucked up their business. The same the moment you decide to like, oh, I'm not gonna go anymore. Oh, I'm gonna start drinking. I'm gonna start doing drugs. I'm gonna start going out. Suddenly you've kind of decimated the entire industry. So they need you to keep coming. So again, it's interesting to see how they pivot in that regard. But that was from R A. And then continue on here what else i want to speak about free face plan megan and harry does not go about that one don't care mm. oh tim martin the guy from weatherspoons has gotten a bit of hot bother because he told his staff to go and work at tesco which i don't really have a problem with really um i'll quickly read this article for you so this is from the Evening Post. Weatherspoon's founder Tim Martin has told staff who might not be paid during the lockdown to go work at Tesco's. This has got again. This got a lot of negative reaction online. I don't know why. Maybe again because I don't know much about this. Tim Martin. He might have said stuff in the past or might align himself with people who are quite unsavory or people who you know the general British public has deemed to be um, a risk or problematic, quote unquote. But just in isolation, I don't necessarily see a problem with it. Like you know, he's a private business owner. If he decides he doesn't want to furlough his staff who, you know, work in these pubs, then so be it. He probably thinks they're quite interchangeable, which they probably are. Um, they don't probably treat them well anyway in the first place. So why do you want to be furloughed by that place anyway? It's not really, you know, for me to answer. But if it's your job, it's your job. Um, but let's read the article. It says here, Weatherspoon founder Tim Martin has been widely criticised after he told employees of the popular pub chain to go work at Tesco's while pubs are closed, warning them that they could face delays over pay. Weatherspoon shut all those pubs on Friday morning. Right, this is what, when day was that? 24th of March. So last month on uh, Friday morning for the introduction of the social distancing measures from the government. In the video message to Everspoon's 40,000 employees, Mr. Martin hinted that he could find employment at supermarkets while their measure was in place. Though Mr. Martin claimed that the staff would be would be paid for work carried out until the pubs were closed last Friday, the company would not be paying staff any more until the UK government fulfills the promise to cover the wages the staff affected. So that was that's fine. I think the whole furlough thing was that they were going to cover 8% of the wages for most companies. But I think then it got realised that, you know, it's going to be a delayed payment. So the companies will have to front that cash first and then the government will give you it um, later on down the line, which is OK. But I think at that moment in time, it wasn't even agreed that that was going to be the case. So the only problem I have with these sort of things or these sort of articles, because most of the reason why they're writing it is because they want to, you know, 
him in a bad light is that if you don't agree with the guy's politics or you think he's a bit of a disgusting human being i think the best way to treat the best way to kind of protest it especially someone who kind of aligns himself a lot of his business right he is mr weatherspoon when you open the menu he's fucking in it sometimes depending on which one you go to especially the, the fucking magazine they have in store that's horrendous so he's part of it he you know he wants you to know his face and how he speaks and shit he's always on um panel discussion shows and here in the uk if you don't like the guy just don't go to his pub in it and you completely cut him on your knees like that's it you've protest you've made it loud and clear that you don't run run for that but unfortunately most or unfortunately for unfortunately for people that don't like him unfortunately for his bank account most of the country you know likes the, the pub chains that he's built you know they charge really low prices the food is fucking dog shit but if you don't mind it you don't pay that much you get to sit sit down and un, you know it's there's no sense of feeling like you don't fit in in the weather spoons everyone you go to it feels like it's you know a local um quick service for the most part <clears throat> they all take card i understand why people would decide to go but i think again if you want to protest just don't go there yourself in it and i think there's actual video of it of him talking about it but let's see if i can get the video i'm actually saying what he said but i actually don't see the issue in it personally myself let's see if we can pass out what the problem might have been here <laughs> this is from twitter from a lady called rachel swindon let's see here what are you saying joined and that's half the number of people who work in our pub if i'm being honest i say you can you can get the furlough payments and stay at home if you're offered a job at a supermarket many of you will want to do that if you think it's a good idea do it I can completely understand it if you've worked for us before. Which I don't think is a bad thing, isn't it? Really, he's telling people once if they want to get furloughed, they can. But if they're not willing, because if they're not willing to wait it out, go somewhere else where they might pay you. Because again, there's no guarantees that these people on furlough once they go back to work will have a job waiting for them either. They, they might reach a point where the company just runs out of cash, or they might not be able to continue with that role. Or they might want to consolidate things. There's no. It might be a bit more difficult in you know today's employment laws. Um, once you pass your probation, it's quite difficult to get somebody out of a company. Don't get me wrong. I understand that the hesitation is probably there. But if you're signed, if you're if you're not signed those kind of contracts, you have to be a bit worried. And if you're an independent contractor, you might be best. Your best bet might be to go somewhere where you be you know standard wage for a couple of months, and then this to make some changes after the fact but i don't necessarily see a real issue with that at all really before i promise you we'll give you first preference if you want to come back and we're all obviously oh, well, that's good understand that you don't want to wait around for us to reopen but deeply appreciate your work uh, i've just so much enjoyed talking to you in my pub calls uh, over the weeks Again, I don't see the issue with it personally. He was quite upfront and honest. Um, he wasn't going to pay anyone. Because I think people were calling. Again, this is a weird thing. This happens a lot with the charity, isn't it? Like, you hear a celebrity X gives money to charity, and suddenly everyone's kind of getting in their pockets and asking them, oh, this is only 10% of your, of your net worth, though. Most of the people saying it, though, don't have, a, you know, don't have more than a grand to their name in savings. Imagine if somebody told you to give that grand to somebody or to a charity or to somebody more in need. How weird their face will start you know moving like oh, what you want me to give that all of it to that person right you wouldn't do that so imagine just having that amount of wealth that amount of power that amount of influence and deciding at the goodness of your heart to take some of that money and give it to a good cause even if the even if you do even if your intentions are um uh ultimately quite selfish right i don't necessarily do you care now like especially you know i've heard you know that in some regions of sicily the mafia has taken over or taken control and they're the ones that are supplying the local neighborhood with food and providing people with jobs and security and all that sort of shit right um would you care if you're a family in sicily right where your next meal is coming from if it's from the mob or it's from the government would you give a shit the fact that you've been fed and your kids have clothes on their back and your hot water's running you wouldn't care would you so i think people who get on their moral high horse now about this sort of stuff with celebrities giving money and saying it's not enough is it's just ridiculous really we should be grateful they're getting given anything considering the circumstances right usually it's the government's point like this isn't a celebrity's 
problem. It shouldn't be their job to bail us out or to provide you with, you know, solutions. It should be the people that you elect into these positions. They're the ones that, you know, the ones that collect your taxpayer dollars or taxpayer pounds. They're the ones that should be uh, providing some solutions, but they're not. And again, like I think, like I said, like he's a private business owner. If he decides he doesn't want to, you know, cover his staff, you know, out of his own pocket for a certain amount of time, then it is what it is. Um, I'm sure it's probably changed since he's agreed with a furlough thing, but I didn't see a problem with it. And again, like I said, I think if you work for somebody like him or a Mike Asher Sports Director, you know exactly who these people are. You can't necessarily then turn around and be surprised they don't bother Teresa. You know what I mean? They've kind of told you what their politics are from the very beginning. So just kind of, you know, it is what it is. But let's move on there. What else we have here that I thought was interesting? Three more weeks. We spoke about that already. Um, DIY Patty and Bum We spoke about that, that too the, the, the Superstar DJ's coming back Oh yeah this one's a, this one kind of touched my stomach Didn't it I think I didn't mention this one already but This is an article from Mixmag This is from Why are Superstar DJs so keen to reconnect with the underground Because that's all that's going to be left unfortunately And this is an interesting one to end on Because this is a real good summation On the stuff I spoke about earlier About there being a need for people to return To the kind of you know The base level of raving And connecting with people Can I think that my estimation is that once everything reopens The first things that we're going to see are Illegal raves, illegal fucking forest raves Warehouse raves Those are the first things that are going to spring up Because the licensed place, the place that are just legit they would they don't want to be liable for anybody potentially getting sick or ill at their establishment so they're going to wait until the ban is lifted for venues that are above you know their capacity limit you know if you're next to a while you can't reopen because every room you have is more than 100 people but if you're a warehouse person and you do those mad undercover underground raves you can do whatever you want but those events are at their core what real raving and what real club culture is about right um, it's less about who's playing it's less about who's going to be there and more so just about enjoying that life culture connecting with people on the dance floor sharing the love for music and all that other extra stuff that you might do on the side and unfortunately the one people that are going to be able to uh, play on those platforms fortunately or unfortunately depending on what side of the fence you sit on are going to be people who are actually plugged into the scene who are part of that community who are friends who are, you know grew up in the same whatever and less so the you know person that fills a thousand uh, capacity venue or whatever maybe they're not going to want to take that hit to come down to play at that level but they also want to be um, looked at as that they can do it because number one what we do quite well I think as a scene is that we protect the underground quite well I think it could be better but for the most part people are quite good at sniffing out you know the people that are in it for a quick buck the people who are just you know dead the people that have been pushed by a marketing company or pushed by a label and usually the good thing is that for the most part you can sustain you can make you can provide for yourself being an underground act it's a bit more difficult it requires a lot more work it's a lot more hustle whatever it may be right your there's more fluctuations maybe your salary but you can sustain yourself being an independent producer dj whatever it may be event organizer more so than just doing all the big events and i think this article touches upon it so it's from mix mag it says the following um, why superstar DJs um, so keen to reconnect with the underground? Producers turned pop stars have made their millions and now they want to trade the big stage for basements. So, here, it says imagine this. Um, imagine it, you're the top of the four DJ wish list, only one million per gig at Vegas residency. You've had a decade long string of global hits. Your bronze body advertises a money underwear, and it's highly likely that your ex says Swift wrote a song about you. Celebrity recording sessions at your early mansion have replaced uh, stacked supermarket shelves at, uh, at dumb fires. Yes, you are Calvin Harris. Recently, you released a two track EP as Love Regenerator, which is one of the gayest names in the world, uh, with an underground sound that earned um, plaudits from the likes of Scream and ended up on Mix Mag's big tunes. But why bother? Why did fellow platinum pop star David Guetta invent a new underground alias, Dead Mouse, uh, make techno for Richie Horton's label? Why are artists who've conquered the mainstream so determined to retain their links or connect with underground credibility? Because they know, because that's the thing, right? You're obviously going to get that's why I, f I respect someone like a Dixon because I think for the most part he was able to play the Ibiza game on his terms of course right do it his way whilst also promoting his own label whilst also pushing his own aesthetic and his way of programming 
but he was able to take that big money which you're obviously going to get mostly during the summer months festival season like be for you know residencies and shit and then parlay that into his you know lost in the moment kind of you know out of this world experiential events and into your merch and all that sort of stuff and keep that underground bit still ticking over i think that problem comes when you're the artist and you suddenly get one big track and you just go to the other side because what ends up happening with people realize is that usually you stop being the flavor of the month that's the problem with that kind of industry it's very flat very flash in the pan i'm sure people like david Guetta are probably suffering from it right he's probably had a loads of fans coming in and out cycling in and out of loving him and thinking he's overrated and thinking of you know martin garrish with the next one and then he's going to go for the same thing too so because of that they have to hope that they make enough money in the first jump or they just keep banging out the sets or the bookings until it stops so that once it does stop you don't need to go out and play anymore because you've essentially got 20 million in the bank but some of those guys who are at their core still music fans they're still fans of dance music they're still you know ardent djs they still you know maybe look at festival streams and shit that give a shit about the community who just want to sell out for the sake of it they're the ones that are kind of longing to go out because they know once shit goes bad like it is now and when shit reopens and people are a bit scrappy they want to be part of the scrappy crew they don't want to still be at home doing live streams because imagine that happens imagine all the illegal raves start going on and they're booking all your favorite people who are respected in the underground scene but then the guys that are not the guys and girls who aren't respected are still at home live streaming to an audience of five people because everyone's at this warehouse party somewhere that's not the flick everyone wants so it continues here harris says he wanted to rediscover the way i originally began producing music 22 years ago before i ever thought about how it might be perceived for outside forces what he describes as just pure fun and experimentation it might seem to more cynically minded like a calculated jump on the current bandwagon of course for amen uh break back bangers and um 90s trance updates but the man's beheading the recent rave revival paul wolford aka special request uh, responded on twitter with go on son and confirmed the pair have been having a natter um which again i don't have a problem with people that have gone pop going back to the underground it's perfectly fine it's just funny and it's also needs to be cautious that they don't take away the opportunities from people who are putting the work who've kind of stayed the course who've you know it took a hit financially from it by just not playing big sets or big stages places wherever they may be and they've just essentially because that's a problem once you're underground you have to probably play more to earn the same amount of money people are getting paid for doing one or two events and again it's just what you want to do with your career in it like when you get into it what do you want to be who do you kind of model yourself in i think it maybe gets difficult when you've kind of been doing it for a long time you don't see anything coming up from it and then suddenly you know you start getting booked by these big clubs everywhere that are horrendous but they're willing to pay you it's the and again i think you know there's a lot of uh wanting of approval when you do these kind of gigs right and you who are dj and stuff so when somebody gives you some sort of love and does appreciate you because you know they want you to come play at their place and they want to fly you out it can be tempting not to say no but i think a lot of people need to really look at it as a long game because the what you don't want is for both sides of your fan bases to kind of push away from you imagine the underground people saying nah we don't want you because we think you're fake and because you're engineered this thing and also you don't want your fans have doubt on you the fans have kind of jumped aboard because you're pop thinking that you've lost your way because you've gone back underground and you end up with nobody so it continues here um, others were less kind andrew lovefingers hog <laughs> commenting the dude has the dude was actually there for the first wave and came up on this shit he just chose to go commercial which is true garbage which i haven't seen agree with while joseph k skewed the tracks are exactly what you'd expect as an edm trying to make something proper would sound like cold and that's a problem too and he can't you can't be calvin harris trying to make um, dance music when you just hold up in your home watching streams online or you know whatever maybe you have to be part of the community that like, yeah, you i'd imagine it's what it's, it's probably the same sort of feeling that exists in a comedy world with eddie murphy when it was announced eddie murphy's gonna have his comedy special on netflix a lot of the comedians were nervous about how they were going to approach him at the comedy club because the understanding amongst them was that the only way for him to get back to where he was before or any or closer level was him to go back on the road and start doing gigs and clubs he, he there was no way he could just be telling jokes to a mirror and then get into a stage and then try and perform in front of an audience it's not going to work um so that was the trepidation behind it, isn't it would somebody that big or somebody that famous want to go to just clubs and do it and the good people do right um 
Seinfeld does it right when he's one of the biggest acts out, out there and Kevin Hart does it he'll go on the road and just start performing in a random club and just pop up with that and, and announcing so he can practice his craft so I guess if those guys have to do that in order to perform a special it's going to be viewed by you know, a wide majority of people for somebody like a Kevin Hart just to sit at home and think about what he thinks dance music people would want nowadays or to him to tap into the rave thing and the trance thing and try and make a track that works out isn't necessarily great and again I have to be honest that EP that he put out under his new Love Love Renegade whatever that fucking dumb name is was fucking terrible I dashed that in the bin straight away I thought it was pretty shit um more so because it was his name attached to it it got the more of a shit treatment on my listening but I would have been pleasantly surprised and happy if it was good but it wasn't and it continues a long way back for producers who outgrew the original scene or it's a long way back for producers who outgrew the original scene or it dropped in favor of chasing pop records just behind Harris on the highest paid DJ list was David Guetta who has become synonymous with platinum selling global hits and the type of set memorable described I remember he described in these pages as cheesier than the Frenchman's socks. <laughs> Jesus Christ, yeah. He recently did something in Miami, actually, too. It was similar to that. Anyway, it continues. Yeah, his origins was playing hip hop in Acid House alongside likes of Long Garnier, Bloody Hell, in gay clubs and warehouse parties in Paris. Look how much his dead careers have diverged. That's a thing as well, I always really wonder. Like a Carl Cox and a Sven Bar. I wonder what Carl Cox thinks like when he sits down about his career. Obviously, he's banking out and he's fine. He doesn't give a shit, but. How their careers have diverged, right? From playing a love parade in Berlin in '99, right, with you know millions of people right around, you know, free love, you know, at the height of that kind of Berlin scene, and then Senva is like still going, you know, he's gone mainstream. He's a big act, don't get me wrong, but he can still tear up a Bergheim, right? People still want to go see him play in some dungeon warehouse somewhere in the middle of Stuttgart. But can Carl Cox really say people give a shit about him in the underground scene? Probably not. Does he give a shit? I don't know. Same with Long Gagne and fucking David Guetta. Imagine being Long Gagne. You can make a score for a movie. You can hop no with celebrities at Cannes Film Festival. You can go and play back to back with Seth Tr- with um Calvin. What you know, Seth Trucks also then. Oh, his name's up here. But you can play back to back with Richie Horton, but you know, David Guetta can't, and he's he's resigned to having to play his outdoor DJ sets for residents in Miami somewhere. Um, uh, they continue to yeah, the, the parties in 2018. Um, the the in 2018, Getta confirmed that he was behind the fourth of our workers, Jack B. Alias. I wanted to make a music just for fun with absolutely no commercial <laughs> approach to it. Sh- this guy, man, I'm doing it for love of music. Oh, great, thank you. So, everything else you provided was just not for love, it's just the fucking ear rape us. He continues, um, when Dead Mouse swapped his mask for a test pilot. Monique here, uh, releasing some creditable techno on plus he plus eight story he said I've always aspired to be a little more underground I like techno really dubby old stuff and I like it Ugh. speaking to a new industry veterans it's clear that these aren't isolated cases because most DJs in the starting underground or at least are inspired by underground scenes the most satisfaction and kudos come from playing in that environment one publisher told us DJs who become that big and cross over will miss it that's why they reinvent themselves with an alias. They want to be connected. I know more EDM DJs who are just no huge household names, but seriously want to be Seth Truxler. What other DJ could think about them is really important, which is how it should be, right? I think a statement comedy, that there should be more of an understanding that you should. And again, just be true to yourself. I think a lot of those people, once they do cross over, you, I think as a fan, you probably have to know that, you know, your favorite actors are sell out, which is hard to deal with. But come on, man, like, you know, it's, it's you got into especially the love that you got into in the beginning there has to be some sense that you, you want to carry that forward you want to inspire the next generation to do the same thing right you want to do that i'd imagine so so why would you risk that just to kind of cross over make a few bob and then again that money is empty isn't it like imagine the love and the appreciation that you get from attending a really well respected festival somewhere or club night and then your favorite artists that you looked up to when you were coming up also performing with you. There's a weird kinship that you probably don't necessarily get playing a mega stage somewhere where there's no one playing in front of you. There's a million fucking, there's 17 CDJs in front of you, like fucking Tomorrowland or something, right? Um, you have fans who just jump up and down, have no idea who you are. They're just there to go and see the main person who's going to play later on and close the fucking thing. There has to be a balance, I would say. I'd say, yes, go get your money, right? Like, again, like a Dixon did. Go and get your money to find your label, to be able to pay your artists, to be able to make some more merch, to put on your own parties. But don't forget about 
playing, you know, fucking Robert Johnson, you know, every other Sunday they have free because you're passing through. That might that that is the most important thing as opposed to just comp- because that's the problem they have. They're just completely cutting themselves off and going to collaborate with all the glitzy people in Hollywood. You should do that and also go to the warehouse party that's in your hometown, right? And just offer to play for free just for the love. And imagine what that will do. Imagine when you're coming up, you're Kevin Harris and you're still playing these dusty raves somewhere and people have videos of you playing their fucking college dorm room. You just throw up a tweet, hey, I mean, yeah, I got some CD, I got some CDs. Does anyone want to play? Does anyone want me to play in their fucking fret party or something? Imagine how far that would go in terms of solidifying his connection with the quote unquote underground. But instead, they just cut ties and bank everything and then. Once they want to come back, they want their fans to give a shit. Like, come on. But anyway, the article's long. I'll put it in the show notes you guys to check out. It's a really cool article here written by a guy called uh, Peter Walker. Some mixed mags called Why Super DJs are so keen to connect with the underground. I'll put it in the show notes. Anyway, that's an hour of the show. Thanks so much for tuning in. The Xenotica show is number 303. As per usual, for my patient regarding myself, go to my website, Xenotica.com. Down below, be able to find links to awards my social media and all that sort of stuff follow me on all those platforms if it's your first time watching smash that like button hit subscribe and leave a comment below let me know what you think and until then see you guys very very soon take care peace bye